evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Inane Dragon. And tonight, I'm taking on one of the biggest threats ever to oppose the Atheist Mafia. Godless Cranium. Okay, not really, but he did inspire me to make this video. Cranium and Caitlin Chloe put together a response to a pile of nonsense from Mr. Brass. A link in the description. In a case of responseception, this touched on a perennial topic of annoyance for a happy hedonistic alcoholic like myself. Alcoholics Anonymous, the dreaded 12 steps, beast of prohibition. Okay, in fairness, it arose in the post-prohibition era, but damn it, don't ruin a good meme with facts. The 12-step program, along with any treatment plan, follows a specific set of rules that requires cooperation and an unquestionable belief for it to work. You clearly don't know what you're talking about, Brass. Fortunately for you, I do know what I'm talking about. The 12-step program was first developed in the 1930s by Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith, both of whom were devoutly religious. Obviously, since they were both very religious, their program reflects this and originally contained religious material. However, as Caitlin just pointed out, the parts of the program that actually work and are useful to everyone, instead of just the Christians among us, can be used without the religious horse shittery it was originally embedded in. Many programs have chosen to alter the 12-step program so that it can serve anyone who is suffering from alcohol addiction by keeping the original principles, such as admitting you have a problem and taking responsibility for past actions, while at the same time getting rid of the superstitious nonsense that originally came along with it. Now I do want to caveat this by saying that for some people, Alcoholic Anonymous works. And for these people, it works well. More fucking power to you if that's your situation. But should we be using it as a model for treatment? Does Mr. Brass have a point? Is Godless Cranium's soft-handed retort, which only points out how we could slough off the religious bits and keep the good actually satisfy as a rebuttal? I say no! every one of these questions. Consider Godless Cranium's suggestion that we could strip out the religious woo and have significant amounts of useful advice left over. Just how much advice would we really have? For that, Cirrus the Skeptic, dear friend of the channel, has lent his voice to the 12 steps and even a brief intro explaining the core philosophy from reference one, link down in the description. Take it away, Cirrus! Because recovery is a lifelong process, there's no wrong way to approach the 12 steps as long as you accept Jesus and your heart and soul and tithe. As the participant tries to figure out what works best for their individual needs. In fact, most participants find that they will need to revisit some steps or even tackle more than one of the steps at a time. Here are the 12 steps as defined by the Alcoholics Anonymous. The 12 Steps, originally conceived by a pair of drunks looking to quit in the 1940s, does have some good ideas contained in it. As with much religious talk, though, you have to repeatedly, even drastically, reinterpret the literal words in order to find the good ideas. I'm not here to tell you that AA won't work. It actually can, though the scientific evidence for it is weak and all over the place. Some studies have found AA to be worse than quitting on your own, or using alternate treatment methods, while others seem to put AA's success rate at over 70%. AA's most recently published self-reporting states that after five years, only 13-14% to 14 of members have maintained sobriety, the exception in long-term success being the 20-plus year cohort, averaging a sobriety rate of 22%. This report is limited in a very serious way. It doesn't include any metrics for people who have left AA, meaning that people who quit AA then started drinking aren't included. Which statistics should we believe? Well, all of them and none of them, because the statistics are all correct for the context of the study which produced them. The problem is generalizing these statistics beyond that limited context. One generalization that seems to be validated by this data is if you are motivated to quit drinking, religious or at least spiritual, and choose AA for yourself rather than being compelled to attend, then there is a fairly reasonable chance AA will help you succeed in quitting for life. Why can't we make this work for everyone, though? Well, for that you really only need to learn the 12 steps. As we do, we'll see if we can't use them as the foundation of a secular support group to replace AA for everyone. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. 
Unless you're also going to be a nihilist or a Christian, it should be pretty obvious that no one can change their life while simultaneously being incapable of changing their situation in life. This step is counterproductive without the religious mumbo-jumbo that comes later. Someone convinced of their own incapacity to change has no reason to try and change. Insofar as people can be said to have power, we have the power to try and change even the worst of our situations. It sucks, but we can make it happen. You could improve this step by making it clearer that you don't have as much power as you might believe. Focus on one of the better ideas coming out of 12-stepping. Taking abstinence one day at a time. Maybe, instead of admitting powerlessness, step one could be, we admit we struggle with alcohol and may need help controlling this behavior. It's less nihilistic, admits that we are ultimately responsible for ourselves and our actions, but can't always do everything on our own. Works whether you're secular or religious. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Do I really have to explain why this one is religious to its core? Yes, in principle, your higher power could be your employer who will fire you if you don't get your ass sober. However, that won't jive with future steps. What's an atheist to do? In a 2004 episode of Penn and Teller's Bullshit, it was reported that atheists might choose a tree or a rock as their higher power. The only limit is that it cannot be yourself. On the other hand, AA's write-up of step two is very clear, and I quote, Whether agnostic, atheist, or former believer, we can stand together on this step. True humility and an open mind can lead us to faith. And every AA meeting is an assurance that God will restore us to sanity if we relate ourselves to him. If that isn't Christian dogma pretending at ecumenicalism, I've never attended a Baptist sermon. I've attended a Baptist sermon. There is no avoiding the theological implications of this step as understood by AA, even as the authors of the study, Alcoholic Anonymous Effectiveness, Faith Meets Science, tie their brains in knots to do so by suggesting it is the AA group itself that stands as the higher power. They do this in an attempt to show a causal link between the philosophy of 12 Steps and their apparent success rate. Because support networks of people working towards a common goal and holding one another accountable are proven to be effective in changing behavior. Which may be the primary way in which AA actually is successful insofar as it may be successful. It provides people with a support network dedicated to getting off the sauce. For our purposes, let's replace step two with, by supporting one another and being accountable to each other, we help not just ourselves, but our fellows control our behavior. Unlike the religious sanctimony of a higher power, everyone can accept this religious or otherwise. It reaffirms that you are ultimately the one who has to make changes in his or her own life. It stresses the truth that a network of friends working together can achieve things that we might individually fail to achieve. As such, this new step strengthens the group's commitment to each other instead of an unknowable fantasy. Net result? Improved social capital and dedication towards their goal while being generally applicable. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. This is step two, rehashed and reaffirmed. Even though it's supposed to be the step which salvages the sinner, I mean drinker, from the nihilism of step one. If this is starting to sound exactly like the recruitment playbook for a cult, you are absolutely correct. There is no salvaging this step from its religious context and giving it utility in a world where both the secular and the religious can find support in each other, empowered as they are to change their own lives instead of waiting upon a miraculous healing from God. Think I'm being too harsh? Consider how AA puts it. It is when we try to make our will conform with God's that we begin to use it rightly. To all of us, this is a most wonderful revelation. Our whole trouble had been the misuse of willpower. We had tried to bombard our problems with it instead of attempting to bring it into agreement with God's intention for us. Down this road lies only theism. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 
this is a bit of advice that can be generally accepted by anyone. At least, once it's been salvaged from the religious dogma of steps one through three. I'm happy to preserve it as step three of our reformed, secular Alcoholic Anonymous thought experiment. Finally, one where Godless Cranium's point about keeping the good ideas applies to an entire step. Admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being being the exact nature of our wrongs. At first glance, this is another step we can generally accept. The only reason to slow down a little and look closer at it is to note its commonality with certain types of evangelical Christianity. The idea of standing before everyone else and laying out all you've done wrong can cause an ecstatic euphoria, binding you further to the group through shared secrets. You're bound together not just by the total honesty and abject humiliation, but the knowledge that breaking the trust that honesty shows would lead to the destruction of all members of the group as a cascade of wrongs are publicly unmasked. To see this in the Christian past, just look to Finney's Anxious Bench, wherein the 19th century revivalist would single out members of a congregation and lay out their sins as he saw them or demand they do so themselves. Similar tactics were employed by Abraham Verity when he was active in the 1930s to the 1960s and his successor, Doug Coe. Both ministered to presidents, senators, and foreign dictators. But that's a story for another day. It's also a common tactic of cult leaders throughout history, including Jim Jones of Jonestown and Kool-Aid fame. Even after this reminder that it can be used in a rather manipulative fashion, I'd say that this isn't worth throwing out whole cloth, though we ought to remove the nonsense about God from it. If you want to tell a God that you're a bad boy, go do so. But it adds no value beyond what you already gained from being honest to yourself. Being honest to another person you can trust not only builds that trust and your support group on the road to teetotaling, but it helps them hold you accountable in the future, as they can recognize your particular brand of backsliding more readily. So step four can stay around as, admit to ourselves and at least one other person what we've come to understand about ourselves through our moral inventory. I'll even be kind and chalk this up as another case of Godless Cranium being right about a whole step, so that gives him... two. And I think he'll rack up a few more before we're done. We're entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. Jesus Enema. And just like that, we're back neck deep in the woo-woo. Not only shouldn't you want all defects of character removed, it has nothing to do with quitting alcohol. Some of your defects may be related to your drinking, maybe even many of them. But abandoning them all would just make you boring, not necessarily sober. And more to the point, you are the one who needs to change, and you're the only one, though perhaps with help, who can change you. So instead of miraculous conversion into an entirely new person through baptism, let's go with... Work with your support group to identify which of your failings contribute to your drinking and take steps to correct them, being accountable to one another as you do so, as our fifth step. Humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Second verse, same as the first. Steps six and seven, even in the original, can be combined and discarded. Again, there's no separating or salvaging this from the religious dogma. We're just going to have to kill it with fire. Sorry, Mr. Brass, but this has nothing to do with sobriety. Made a list of persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Finally! AA gets another step that we could just carry forward if we want. Godless Cranium is up to three. However, it's important to note that this one is unnecessary to getting and staying sober. It may help some individuals handle the guilt they feel if they were particular dicks while on the sauce, and addressing that guilt may take away one reason for turning back to drinking. On the flip side, it may also create what appears to be a second impossible task on top of staying sober. It may actually be the straw that breaks the camel's back, causing them to give up and pick up the bottle again. On the whole, this should be a decision made in working one-on-one -on -one with a professional counselor or therapist, not as part of a support group made up of lay people following a guidebook written by lay people. So while it looks and sounds good, and may even be the right action for most people, we should set this 
outside the proper realm of our hypothetical secular support group. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Another case of AA splitting steps up in order to boost their step count. Though, I'll give the point to Godless Cranium. This goes in the same bin as Step 8. But I would consider this the realm of professional health care, not support groups. Continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Huzzah! One where we can not only give Godless Cranium his point, but roll it into our secular steps. For those who might have lost count, as we've tossed so many into the ditch, this is now step five and works in tandem with steps three and four as an ongoing self-evaluation to check on our progress. This is the embodiment of the best bit of advice I've ever seen AA give a person. Take a big project like this one day at a time. Don't look for huge changes from your original self-evaluation to this one, only that you've made some progress between here and there. Maybe you even backslide once in a while. That's okay. You've got a group of people here to support you in recovering that ground. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Praying only for knowledge of his will, for us and the power to carry that out. How the fuck is this legitimate medical advice? Meditation is a useful tool, and I'm not here to shit on it. Or even to mock prayer right now, I've done that often enough elsewhere. However, it's the rest of this step that makes us throw it out entirely. I've never found any reason to accept that God isn't anything more than one of the many inner voices we conjure up for ourselves. At best, this might help you understand yourself, your inner goals and desires, but dressed up and projected as infallible by calling it God, this step goes in the trash with the rest of the woo steps. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and sinners, and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Missionary work isn't the purpose of any good support group. For anyone to change, they have to want to change, not be ordered to change. Now, we could reformulate this step, but it's honestly not worth it. Advertising a service is a given for any organization. Making it a step encourages the evangelical religious kind of nonsense we're trying to get away from. It has no utility in the actual work of being sober. So we're ditching it. 12 steps sounds like technology, right? It has numbers. Do step one, step two, and so on. You've fixed your flat tire or cured your rash. But 12 steps isn't technology, it's religion. In religious cults, you take people with bad problems and teach them to define themselves as sinners, diseased to their very core. You teach them to be ashamed, weak, helpless. Then you offer them one way out, by obeying infallible authority, like a god. Don't believe them. It ought to be clear by now that the easiest way to sum up the 12 steps is as follows. Admit you're a sinner. Accept God as your only salvation from yourself. Work to understand and accept God's will, then proselytize. This is the Christian message, not alcohol cessation treatment. It can work for those who are already motivated to change and are religious, providing a support group of people with shared experiences. I'd never say AA should go away for this reason alone. But it's a terrible program for people who aren't religious. It won't work for people who aren't already motivated to change. And insofar as the research is valid, the evidence bears that out. As such, we need alternatives to AA for the rest of us. Ones that don't abase the individual, but build them up within a supportive group environment, empowering alcoholics to change their own lives. Can AA be used as a basis for that, as Godless Cranium suggests? Well, in the end, it seems we've found five points out of a possible 12 for Godless Cranium's position. Since AA has, beyond the 12 steps, the notion of taking things one day at a time, and this is a central to any significant change in your behavior or thinking, we'll give Godless Cranium a bonus point. So Godless Cranium is at about a 50% batting average, which, okay, Batters call that good, but does truth care about anything at 50%? That's flipping a coin. 
there are good things that can be salvaged from AA to form a secular group. And we've even created a hypothetical secular five steps in the process. Thankfully, my five step program can be left hypothetical and I can go back to drinking. Secular organizations for those looking to quit the sauce without getting addicted to God instead can find a fair few locations throughout at least the US and Canada in reference seven of this video. As for me, I can quit anytime I want. Unless that is someone sends me more flat earth proof videos. If you've enjoyed this inanity, consider subscribing for more of the same. Help my poor little metrics out by sharing the video around and getting involved in the dialogue down below. Thank you all, and have a good night.